Well, good afternoon, uh, everyone, and a very warm welcome uh, to this OECD conference on environmental justice. Um, I'm uh, Joe Tyndall, the Director of the Environment Directorate here at the OECD, and I'm really pleased uh, to be able to, to make just a few opening uh, remarks. Thank you all for being with us um, on what's turning out to be um, another slightly chilly and rather wet uh, Paris day. It's a pleasure to see so many of you here, though, at our very first conference on uh, a newly emerging and very important issue. Now, while international discussions on uh, environmental justice are relatively new, the topic itself is by no means novel. Uh, environmental injustices have been experienced by communities around the globe for uh, a long time. However, more recently, a growing body of research has highlighted the links between environmental disparities and a range of demographic and socioeconomic characteristics. With this growing research and awareness, governments are increasingly recognizing the importance of improving equity and justice across many areas of, of policy making. And as countries step up to tackle the triple planetary crisis, climate change, uh, biodiversity loss and pollution, issues of environmental justice are more relevant than ever. Uh, especially as we transition to a more sustainable future. Factoring in environmental justice is going to help ensure that nobody is left behind. Now, it's important not, not just because of questions of fairness and equity. It's also important for governments to ensure their populations, their communities are supportive of the transition uh, in economies to deal with these environmental challenges. So our, our aim over the course of today and tomorrow is to initiate a dialogue uh, that's going to help us all better understand environmental justice, what is meant by it, and how it can be strengthened across country context. So to this end, we are very pleased to welcome a big number of, of um, distinguished speakers from around the world and across different disciplines. We're also um, extremely pleased that so many of you uh, are joining us here today in uh, Paris and online. It seems to be literally standing room only at the moment. There are a few people um, at the, the back of the room. In total, we've got more than 500 participants from all over the world uh, attending. And I hope you're going to find uh, this conference um, as stimulating, exciting, and interesting as I do. I am really looking forward to it. So before we begin, a few housekeeping notes. Those of you who are at the, um, the seats with nameplates uh, who wish to take the floor, please do so by raising your flag um, and, and, or your nameplate. Uh, those of you who are sitting further uh, um, around in the room and open seats are invited to, to raise your hand. I just have to check the schedule for um, people who are online. Are they able to... No, they, can email oh, they, can, they can email questions uh, if you're uh, uh, participating online. There is simultaneous interpretation uh, into English, French, and Spanish, uh, and that's going to be provided for all interventions. So if you want to make an intervention in French or in Spanish, it would be very much appreciated if you could just give a signal that you're going to do so before getting into the substance of your, your speech. Um, so that will allow uh, everybody else who needs to a moment to uh, put headsets on. And lastly, I would like to take this opportunity to mention uh, the session on national approaches to environmental justice. That's gonna be an opportunity to share your national experience and to discuss this together as a group. Group, I'm flagging it now, uh, just in case you might want to already be thinking about remarks uh, you could want to, to make tomorrow. Uh, now that we've covered the basics, I am delighted uh, to start this opening session because it, it provides an introduction to the topic of environmental justice and the opportunity to better understand what it is as a concept, the issues uh, that countries 
uh, are facing and identifying and addressing it. So we do have um, a very tight schedule. Um, and I've got three panellists uh, to speak in this first session. Each will have 12 minutes to present, and then we'll hold questions until the end, uh, when there'll be a little bit of time, a few minutes left uh, for discussion. So with that, please join me in welcoming our three distinguished panellists. Uh, with us today, we have uh, David Schlossberg, um, Erko, forgive me if I'm not presenting that very well, um, visiting professor at the Helsinki Collegium for Advanced Studies in Finland, also a director uh, of the Sydney Environment Institute at the University of Sydney, Australia. Paige Weber, to his right, uh, who is assistant professor at the University of California, Berkeley uh, in the United States. And thirdly, to my immediate right, Shadul uh, Agrawala, who is the head of the Environment and Economy Integration Division. It's a bit of a mouthful, isn't it? Um, in the Environment Directorate here at the OECD. So um, to kick off the discussion, I'd first like to invite David to present on the, the origins, the evolution and the theories. Sorry. You just need to... The, for, no, 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 don't press. <laughs> um, when you press the button, the light goes red for you. It goes off for me and nobody can hear. So um, <laughs> I just wanted to finish um, and say you're going to talk on the origins, evolutions and theories of justice. So, David, now the floor is yours. <laughs> So sorry, thank you. Um, thanks for the introduction. Thanks for having me. It's a, a huge monstrous privilege to be the first speaker at such a conference and a major responsibility. Um, I can't claim to be able to sort of comprehensively introduce the concept and practice and movement of environmental justice in such a short intro, but I will try and do a little bit of grounding and mainly focus on how the idea of justice has been defined in and by the movement uh, for environmental justice over time. And then I'll talk a little bit about some forthcoming work that surveys environmental justice scholars and organizers globally. And I think it's a nice compliment to the recent work uh, around states. So just a few um, takeaways, again, a very short origin story, talk a little bit about how the justice of environmental justice has been very broad and plural. A bit um, more recently, how the idea has become um, more critical and more focused on issues of power. Uh, I'll talk about some multiple barriers to achieving justice uh, as, uh, um, as explained, as seen by both scholars and movement organizers, um, and then a bit more positive um, ways to enable environmental justice from the same crew. So simply put, the idea of environmental justice came from communities concerned about being poisoned um, without consent, without inclusion, without knowledge of contaminants, um, alongside other forms of discrimination or injustice. Now I teach my, my students, and it's exactly what you said, that poor and marginalized people have been dumped on as long as there's been waste. And there have been plenty of protest movements uh, about inequitable environmental harms across the globe. But the specific idea of environmental justice was born out of community responses in the US. Um, Love Canal, which led to the development and approval of the US Superfund program in 1980, uh, and it's also sort of the origin story of one of the first community-based networks on waste, the Center for Health, Environment, and Justice. And then Warren County, North Carolina, um, where a broad coalition of residents and civil rights groups, the Congressional Black Caucus and Greenpeace came together to protest the opening of a new toxic waste dump and really kicked off the broad environmental justice movement in the US. Now it's crucial to note the early empirical work and organizing of the environmental justice movement in the US, including the United Church of Christ Toxic Waste and Race Report published in 1987 um, and the first National People of Color Leadership Summit in 1991. And that meeting, I believe, is where some of the globalization of environmental justice begins, in part through the development of the 17 principles of environmental justice. And I encourage folks to go back and read those principles 33 years later, and they still illustrate the range of issues and interests and responses we find in the environmental justice movement across the globe. Now, the key here for me is that it is community and movement actions that have generated concerns about environmental justice and the development of the responses of states. 
Okay, so um, part of the reason I'm here and why I have a reputation in environmental justice studies is work that examined what the idea of justice meant to environmental justice activists in the US. Um, and in various publications in the early 2000s, I laid out this idea of justice as being very broad and pluralistic and encompassing. So clearly issues of equity and distribution are key, but also of recognition and respect, of participation and procedural justice, and of the basic capabilities necessary for both individuals and communities to function. Now, the way those kinds of injustices are experienced differs, and different communities um, will focus on different concepts um, and sometimes in overlapping ways. But generally, inequity is obviously about the distribution of environmental risks and harms, but it's also about inequity in the protection afforded by the law, stronger environmental protection for some communities than others. And it's also about inequity in the distribution of environmental goods, parks and green space, public transport, access to decent food and more. But crucial is that environmental justice has never only been about equity. Recognitional injustice is where we start to get at the reasons for such inequity. Why is it these particular communities, black communities, indigenous communities, minorities, the poor generally, uh, this is where the idea of environmental racism, environmental colonialism and discrimination come into play. This idea of recognitional justice gets at the experiences of domination and oppression, of a lack of recognition, of the experience of outright disrespect and dis discrimination of both individuals and communities. Now, procedural justice is fairly obvious. It addresses participation and voice or exclusion from those. It gets the very basic principle, the all affected principle, democratic principle, that people should have a say in the decisions that directly affect them. And then more broadly, communities often articulate what could be called a capabilities approach along the lines of a theory of justice uh, designed by Amartya Sen and Martha Nussbaum. And here, environmental injustice is about the loss of basic capabilities necessary for functioning life health, housing, food, water, air, the ability to practice and replicate traditional ways of life. Those ideas and experiences of injustice are clearly related and intersecting, right? Economic inequity and discrimination leads to exclusion for meaningful participation. A lack of participation helps continue stereotypes and misrecognition, undermining capabilities, makes it difficult to participate and so on. Now, again, this framework was developed out of a study of the US movement 20 years ago. And the frame's obviously been useful. It's been cited plenty in the literature, including in the new OECD report, thank you very much. But I do think it's been useful for government planning as well, especially on thinking beyond equity alone. But about a decade ago, I began to be a bit uncomfortable with the way um, that the framework was being used um, outside of the US in very different places and very different times. Environmental justice has been changing as the experience and principles of environmental justice and the experience of injustice has resonated across the globe. The range of topics has expanded, the range of countries where the term is used and applied has expanded. It's been used on global issues from waste transport to indigenous rights to climate change. So I pulled together a team to do a new global study of discourses of environmental justice in both the scholarly literature and in movement organizations using the term. And again, I think this serves as a nice complement to the survey uh, of states. We actually did three different studies. We used Q if folks want to talk about methodology, um, broad global study, North and South, uh, examining what environmental justice means, what the barriers are to achieving it and what actually enables it in practice. Now, we found an incredible richness in the breadth of ideas encompassed by contemporary EJ discourse, but the central takeaway is a high level of consensus across the movement, not just around issues of recognition and inclusion, which I've mentioned, but also around moving beyond the Western roots um, and biases of the movement and the need to transform power relations uh, and address political collusion. There's diversity across the movement, of course, but this is a new and growing consensus on what has been called a critical environmental justice approach. And I think this development of this more critical approach um, is an important development in the history of global discourse. And we're about to publish on this in the next couple of weeks. So clearly the work illustrates a growing focus on the obstacles to achieving environmental justice in practice. And we specifically examined what scholars and organizers believe are barriers to the implementation of EJ. 
So given the consensus on a critical approach, it's not surprising there was broad agreement on the barriers created by corporate power and institutionalized collusion between elites and private companies. There was a critique of the limits of some mainstream environmental policy, in particular, its common exclusion of diverse community experiences and knowledges. Within that broad consensus, there really are four distinct diagnoses of barriers to change that became clear, each capturing different sites of environmental justice struggles and revealing distinct dimensions uh, of these barriers. Now, I don't have time to go into these in detail, but briefly, um, those four barriers are broad experiences of, of structural um, marginaliz marginalization or organized oppression. There are numerous institutional obstacles to working with governments and legal systems. There are more specific um, focus on policy processes that are exclusionary. Um, and then finally, there are just issues surrounding the discriminatory cultures, not just of government agencies uh, or corporations, but environmental movements as well. So clearly when it comes to the barriers to environmental justice, these findings show the reality and the complexity of social and political obstacles to achieving environmental justice. And frankly, the reality of the way that those who experience vulnerability, those who experience danger uh, in EJ communities um, experience this injustice. Um, now, on the more positive side, um, we looked at what might help overcome those barriers and enable the achievement of EJ in practice. And again, there are a lot of differences in the organizational and activist literature and the scholarly literature, but the consensus is that absolutely key is a focus on raising the profile of local knowledges, local experiences as a counter to the status quo. And within that consensus, there are three different ways or strategies for doing so. Um, the major approach emphasized the importance of bringing community-based knowledges, including indigenous knowledges, into mobilizing, mobilizing and policymaking. Um, there's a real focus on the need for um, what folks call political disruption, just sort of resetting the terms of debate and action on environmental issues. So not just protesting, but organizational change to change that norm of exclusion and exclusionary processes. And then finally, there was another approach more methodologically focused, which is on using available technologies to enhance and to boost local knowledges. There's lots of interest in citizen science, in participatory and crowdsourced knowledge, in the use of mapping and drones and phones and storytelling and social media to enhance this focus on local knowledge. All of these reflected community-based strategies for boosting that knowledge and the power of impacted groups to make a difference. So again, I think this recent work examining quite critical contemporary ideas and discourses about environmental justice um, that's circulating among both scholars and uh, organizers, um, I think this overall focus on the value and importance of community knowledge um, really is a good complement to the OECD report on what governments are doing. I mean, I always encourage my students, many of whom go into government, I'm a politics professor, and I, I want them to understand the range of ideas that they're gonna face in their positions. And I hope this new work is illuminating uh, in that way. So I'm happy to talk more about that forthcoming work now in the next couple of days, but uh, thanks for the privilege uh, of speaking here and I look forward to learning more about the OECD's work. Thanks. Well, thanks very much, David. That was um, it was a gallop through the uh, <laughs> the evolution and, and thinking behind uh, environmental justice. I have lots and lots of questions I would love to ask, but uh, unfortunately, we don't immediately have time. Hopefully, there will be over the course of the next uh, day and a half. Um, but uh, let me now turn to Paige, uh, and, uh, and we'll continue the session with a discussion on empirical approaches and methodologies. So Paige, over to you. Uh, hello, thank you so much for being here. Can you hear me okay? Um, so as Joe said, I'm gonna, uh, that's, thank you so much, David, for that introduction. I'm gonna hopefully complement that with a different side of the story. And what I wanna do with my next 12 minutes is think how um, empirically, how we actually measure environmental justice. Um, and I'm gonna focus on quantitative methods. And I think throughout the course of this workshop, hopefully practitioners of other more qualitative approaches here uh, will be able to chime in. All right, so uh, many different countries and places have different definitions of what environmental justice is, but one thing is common. Uh, there's a notion of a disparity in any environmental outcome or a process generating that outcome. So what I wanna uh, tee up in this introductory session is 
how do we measure this disparity, what is often called in the literature a gap, a difference in um, some outcome or process across different groups. And I want us to start to think about what are the trade-offs and the different approaches to measuring this disparity. And I really want us to be able to connect the choices and how we measure that disparity to what they imply in terms of the policy implications. Um, and finally, I wanna uh, help us think about how we predict where EJ is going in the future. And to do that, we need to understand the mechanisms generating this disparity. So the objectives for my talk is I, I wanna point out some of these methodological decision points if we wanna measure uh, environmental justice. And I wanna highlight some recent advancements um, from uh, the economics uh, area of literature and how we measure these disparities. I'm gonna briefly mention connections to climate justice, which I see as um, a subset of environmental justice. Then we'll talk about the mechanisms generating uh, these disparities. Okay, so as I said, there's a large body of literature emerging uh, and, and the, we'll use the term EJ gap, right? A, a difference in a pollution or environmental hazard between two different groups. But to compute this gap, there's a choice of comparison group. And across the literature, you see a variety of different comparison groups, right? The gap might be by race, income, wealth, class. And the goal is not to come to a consensus about the right gap. It really comes from the historical context and the, um, the empirical setting um, in different country, region, and so on. What's the environmental outcome of interest? Practically, this has been constrained by data availability, um, and we've seen an array of these different outcomes, and I'll highlight some of them today. As David said, it could be an amenity or a disamenity. Um, and so this is something, um, how do we assign this environmental outcome to people, actually? This sounds trivial, but it's not. So something we've seen in the last 10 years of research is um, sophistication in this area, right? So is it just where I live, where I work, um, the air I breathe? How do I know, um, uh, how do you assign the outcome that you're comparing to uh, the people exposed? Um, and then what is the statistical uh, metric to measure this gap? Are you interested in above, below the medium, first or fourth quartile? This I think should be tied to how damages are generated. Is this an environmental burden where we're really interested in extreme exposures or are we not? Are we interested in, in relative gaps? Um, oops, okay. So first I wanna, uh, did I... So first, uh, I wanna highlight some takeaways from the last 10 years of research documenting these gaps. There's clear descriptive evidence that the gaps exist across subgroups. We're not trying to do a meta-analysis here because what have I said that the relevant choice of group depends on the historical context. We see robust findings in certain gaps when the data is there. In the US context, we have a lot of EJ work in air, for example, because we have great air quality data, less so on other media. We've seen a lot of improvements on how we think about assigning these environmental outcomes to people. We've uh, great advances in pollution dispersal modeling in particular for air, uh, new use of uh, data to think about these uh, exposures over time and across generations. And we're moving from just thinking about coincidence, I'm near the environmental um, burden to actually do I experience damages from them. Important methodological point, there's mixed approaches on whether you should condition this analysis on another socio or demographic characteristic. So I can give you an example. Are you interested in pollution exposure across two races or pollution exposure across two races in a certain income group? Both of these questions, research questions, uh, provide some information to help us move forward, but uh, it really depends on the type of research question you're asking. And that small methodological choice can change the implications for uh, the conclusion of the work. One clear thing is that research tends to focus on one setting or pollutant, and there's a clear call um, from communities in this setting to think creatively about how we can measure cumulative impacts. Climate justice. So as I said, climate justice is an emerging as an increasingly popular term, and I see this under the broad category of environmental justice. I'll highlight some of the findings of the type of areas of research we've seen in climate justice. So one example would be the different um, access to local built environment that can intensify, intensify climate impacts. So we've seen works that look at how, resi how um, the residential sorting process leads certain subgroups to live in places um, that are particularly hot in urban settings. Um, we also seen evidence of sorting into zones that are particularly risky uh, with changes from the climate. Um, and clearly all of the uh, environmental justice burdens that are documented, there are uh, opportunities that climate would intensify um, these existing disparities. 
Um, and one area that I think the environmental justice can, movement can um, call more from is in, in climate justice, you see a lot of discussion about policy, in, policy costs and benefits. And so I think right now, environmental justice is just starting to bring some of those policy cost discussions. So for example, if you clean up environment, but raise all the prices, what have you done to environmental justice? That's something where environmental justice is, is bringing that discussion in. Um, just some other key points of intersection on climate justice and environmental justice. So areas where, say, a, a polluting firm is emitting both greenhouse gases and a local coal pollutant, that's really a place where, you, where you'd see this clear connection between climate justice and environmental justice. Incidence of policy costs, so who's paying for um, the, uh, the, the policy to address these issues. Um, and as I said, there's an opportunity for the existing hazards to be intensified. And another area where I think both movements need to look for empirically in the future is the systematic related vulnerabilities. And what I mean by that is suppose you know a certain population is going to be uh, dealing with a certain environmental burden, they have differential abilities to adapt or to pay to healthcare um, or to you know, purchase say an air quality monitor. So different um, related sets of vulnerabilities. Okay, so now I wanna to get to the mechanisms generating these different environmental outcomes that we've seen documented. Um, and this is necessary because if we wanna think about what's going to happen to these documented outcomes in the future with different industry trends or different policies, we need to know where the disparities are coming from in the first place. So um, on the economic side of things, there's broad, uh, we think of four types of mechanisms that I think are good uh, broad categories describing where these disparities come from. The first is residential sorting or so-called coming to the nuisance. So this is the idea that maybe much of your local pollution is determined by where you live. And so you can imagine where I live is constrained by what I can pay for. And uh, we would expect places uh, with say, lower cost of housing may come with more environmental burdens. The second related channel is where polluting industries sort, right? So this might be a function of where the infrastructure is available, but also cheap housing and land costs. And you can see how these two things can work together. The third is more of a pure discrimination channel. So you would, uh, we have evidence of discriminatory politics in both say the enforcement of environmental regulation um, and also the siting of where firms can locate. So this is, interacts with firm sorting too. And then of course we can have a coordination of all of the above, right? Where we have all of these um, channels sort of working uh, in conjunction. Um, I'm gonna preview what we know about each of these mechanisms um, before concluding. So in terms of residential choices, one thing we know is that historical patterns really shape current residential choices. And one reason is uh, the large friction or the large cost of, of relocating. We also know there's discrimination in the set of um, available places where people can move. Um, and we know that there's really different implications for renters versus owners. So if you imagine environmental policy cleans up a location, but raises the housing price, owners are gonna benefit from that capitalization. Their house is now valued more, but renters would face higher housing costs. Um, and we know that lack of information can both um, aggravate EJ disparities, but it's not obvious what information disclosures would do to those disparities. So we know that uh, disamenities or pollution, unknown pollution, it was likely correlated with other unknown disamenities. However, we've seen evidence that differential community pressures, communities that have more political power pushing for information disclosure can lead a differential pattern of where information is known. And finally, we've seen that uh, we need to think carefully about policy-induced cleanup because you can see a case where housing prices increase and the target population say that you were attended to improve their environmental amenities may be faced to out-migrate because they can't afford to live there anymore. Um, in terms of knowledge gaps, like I said, that last channel, the environmental gentrification pattern is largely uh, hard to predict and evidence is mixed, so something we need to push on. Um, we've seen an evidence on residential burdens, but that's just where people live. They might be more exposed where they work, where they play, where they get educated. Um, and we're still needing more work connecting exposure to ultimate damages. And finally, uh, something where hopefully we can pull from the climate justice literature is to think about this trade-off between a better environment, but leading to higher prices um, versus lower pollution. In terms of firms, what do we know about polluting firms? We know they look for low cost land and housing, which can work together with those residential sorting patterns to generate environmental justice disparities. We know that they might strategically locate to avoid regulation. Um, we know that firm siting processes uh, often engage the local public, which can allow procedural justice uh, issues to enter the, the setting. And finally, we know that timing is important and historical infrastructure decisions can drive where firms locate today. 
um, looking ahead, permitting processes are something to really pay careful attention to because different groups have different um, ability to organize politically and different negotiating power. And renewable energy is something to uh, think about in the setting because of the large land use area. It's a disamenity for some, amenity for others. Um, and I'll wrap up in my last minute. So over the last decade, we've seen a surge of interest in this topic and a surge of uh, work in environmental justice. Today, I highlighted some of those findings from the economics area. Uh, in this area, we see no choice of common comparison group or metric to compare the disparity, which is a positive that need, really needs to be context and uh, context specific. Some key advances in this area include how we think about pollution dispersal, in particular with air, and documentation of new data sources um, and documentation of bias in different data sources. The environmental hazards that have been studied are limited to data availability, and this is an area where administrative agencies can help. And looking ahead, what we hoped, and hopefully over the course of this workshop, is to continue the discussion of the mechanisms generating these disparities and overall welfare impacts of cleaning up the environment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paige. That was uh, a fascinating uh, um, set of insights. I mean, really uh, underlining the importance of, of measurement uh, to understand uh, the concept. But equally, um, I really took out of it the, uh, the point about uh, understanding, or thinking about the context. What do you need to know and why do you need to know it to work out how you're going to, to approach uh, a better understanding for policymaking? Um, okay, last uh, to speak, uh, I'm going to invite Shadul to uh, present insights from the uh, OECD's recent work on national approaches to environmental justice. So Shadul, over to you. Thanks very much, Joe, and it's a great pleasure to see so many of you in the room and online. Um, so I'm going to be presenting this report that we've launched today. Uh, but before I do that, let me just acknowledge my co-authors, Edward Bayliss, Yuko Ishibashi, Julia Kailok, and Nicolina Lamhoj. Most of them are in the room, so you'll be encountering them uh, during the course of this conference. So as you've already heard, there's a lot of very rich scholarship on environmental justice. And uh, we've also had a flavor of uh, the kinds of issues that are there in the economics literature in environmental justice. So what's the context of this report and uh, what is potentially our value added in, the, in this broad discourse. Uh, a lot of the literature uh, is very context specific. And as the OECD, one, as we got into environmental justice, one of the questions we were asking was how to have some comparative international view of what's happening in terms of both the drivers of environmental justice movements, but more importantly, what are the policy responses that governments are putting in place to respond to some of those challenges? So within that context, this report does three things. It examines the plurality of the concept of environmental justice, building blocks, underlying causal mechanisms. This is very eloquently covered by the previous two speakers. I'm not going to spend too much time on that. Uh, the second part of this report is reviewing how environmental justice concerns have emerged in different contexts around the world. And last but not least, uh, we're offering a first of its kind policy stock take of how governments across the OECD and beyond are identifying, assessing, and addressing environmental justice. So just coming to the framework, and this is repeating a lot of what has already been said, uh, you know, essentially we're talking about concerns about three clusters of outcomes where certain groups or communities might be particularly disadvantaged. Uh, the first relates to disproportionate exposure to environmental hazards or unequal access to environmental amenities. The second relates to unequal distribution of the costs and benefits of environmental policies. And the third set of issues relate to unequal capacity to engage meaningfully. This includes access to environmental information, access to environmental decision-making processes, and access to legal recourse. And recognitional issues underlie some of these challenges. And of course, as the previous speakers have mentioned, uh, there are a lot of socioeconomic variables which determine uh, whether or not certain groups or communities uh, face these differential pressures. Now, there's clearly a lot to say on it, but it's been very well covered. So I'm going to go to the second two aspects where uh, just to complete the trifecta of introductory talks for this conference. So looking at environmental justice around the world, this is not 
our analysis. This is a map which is put out by a network of academics and civil society organizations. And essentially they have documented verified conflicts related to environmental justice all over the world. Uh, two points to note here. First, these kinds of conflicts cover a whole range of issues from resource extraction to waste management to chemical accidents and, and so on. And second, they're global. These are 3,300 documented cases over the past half century. Obviously it's an undercount, uh, but this is not a jurisdiction specific issue. It's a global issue. Now, just to walk you through a little bit of the history, and I'm boiling down what's happening in entire continents in three bullets. So there's a lot of simplification here. So North America, I mean, uh, David has already given uh, a very rich history of how the environmental justice movement was triggered by evidence of disproportionate exposure of African-American communities to toxic waste. Now, over time, the scope of uh, environmental justice has uh, you know, expanded to include other harms like exposure to air, water and noise pollution, but also natural hazards and climate change impacts, and also looking at the impact of environmental policies, access to information and participation. Now, in the case of Canada, the research and evidence and activism is a bit more recent. It's focused among other things on water contamination and exposure to mercury in First Nations and other communities. And we will be having a presentation from Canada uh, later on in the conference. Now, coming to Latin America, uh, a lot of the concern was triggered by the disproportionate impact of industrial pollution on marginalized communities. Some of this was a result of policy processes, for example, sacrifice zones in Chile. Four or five regions were identified for rapid industrialization and hence uh, ex uh, you know, increased pollution as well. And that was just part of the economic development strategy. Uh, but there were also concerns about environmental justice in the context of economic integration in Mexico following NAFTA and uh, impacts on low-income households uh, from activities of export-oriented industrial parks. Uh, there's also been a lot of attention to exposure of informal settlements to natural and man-made hazards. And in terms of policy responses, one key feature of this region is the emphasis on regional cooperation and emphasis on procedural justice, rights to access to information, participation in legal re recourse, leading to the Escazú Agreement in 2018. Now, coming to Europe, environmental justice and policy discourse is not as prominent, but there's been a lot of research and policy action in many countries on environment health disparities and links to economic deprivation. There's much less emphasis on ethnicity and race, which was talked about uh, particularly by David. One of the reasons might be that in many countries in Europe, including France, uh, the census data does, uh, census is not allowed to collect data for ethnicity and race. And so you can manage what you can measure. So some of it might also be reflecting uh, the kind of data that exists. Uh, then of course, uh, the Aarhus Convention, going back to 1998, which guarantees right to access to information, participation, and legal recourse, which has had a huge impact uh, across Europe in terms of national policies. And then, of course, more recent widespread social concerns about the just transition related to pocketbook issues, or uh, as uh, one of the quotes I remember from the Yellow West movement is, it's hard for me to worry about the end of the world when I'm worried about the end of the month. Hmm. So, that's a bit of a flavor of what's happening in Europe. Coming to Africa, environmental justice as a concept is prominent uh, primarily in South Africa, but there have been broad concerns about the disproportionate impacts of resource extraction, particularly mining in many countries in Africa, but also electronic waste and also natural uh, management of natural resources. Uh, as I said, attention to EJ specifically is in South Africa, going back to the 1980s, so almost coincident with the US movement uh, against the backdrop of the struggle against apartheid. And recognition of environmental rights is there in the 1994 Bill of Rights, adopted in the new constitution in 1996. And we will be having a presentation from South Africa tomorrow to give more detail about both the development but also the challenges. Now, coming to the Asia Pacific region, generally environmental justice is not a term that is used in, in most of the countries. Uh, but I would like to point out to the Bhopal gas tragedy 40 years ago, which raised global consciousness about 
both environmental injustice, but also the transnational dimension, the ownership by a multinational corporation and, and, and the environmental justice implications of chemical accidents. Um, there is explicit focus on environmental justice in Korea, and this was spurred by concerns of unequal access to safe drinking water in the late 1990s. But EJ aspects, even though the term is not used, are reflected in initiatives like culturally informed approach to policy in New Zealand, where they look at differential impacts, particularly on indigenous communities. And we will be having an intervention from New Zealand later on in the conference. So changing gears a little bit, what are governments doing about some of these concerns? And to get insight on that, we circulated a fairly detailed survey to OECD members, but also key uh, developing countries and, and, and of course, uh, um, the European Commission. And we were looking at three sets of issues. Uh, what approaches are governments taking to environmental justice, whether they use the term or not, uh, that's immaterial. Uh, what kind of data are they collecting? What kind of tools are they using? What kind of challenges are they facing? And finally, what kind of policy measures are they putting in place to respond to some of those concerns? So in the end, we got responses from 22 OECD members, the European Commission and three non-member countries, uh, Croatia, Peru, and South Africa. I must also say that these are not responses by individuals. These were coordinated responses, most of the time by environment ministries and agencies, but in some countries like Peru, there was a, a coordinated response from six or seven ministries. So th this does provide a rich uh, repository of information in terms of how these challenges are being tackled by national governments. So now coming to some of the messages from the survey. So few countries address EJ directly, but many more do so indirectly. So there are five countries in our survey where environmental justice is enshrined as a legal term in some form or the other. The United States is a notable example where there've been executive orders going back to 1994, which asked all federal agencies to look at the environment and health implications on uh, minority populations and low income populations. And that's been deepened and broadened in a more recent executive order in 2023. In the case of Colombia, uh, environmental justice is defined in rulings of the constitutional court. There was a case um, brought by an indigenous group about the siting of a landfill and the court ruled, uh, citing in part the definition of EJ from the US that the, the rights of that community were violated. And in South Africa, EJ is referenced in the Framework Act on Environment Policy. But beyond these countries, there are a number of other countries where the term is used internally. Uh, so uh, in, in the case of Germany, the German Environment Agency uses the term environment justice and the focus is much more on the differential exposure to environmental hazards uh, in certain communities and groups. They've also developed a toolbox to improve environmental justice outcomes in municipalities. In the case of Canada, it's actually moving to the blue category because there's draft legislation uh, which is making its way on uh, environmental justice and combating environmental racism. And in Scotland, reports and public consultations of environmental justice go back almost 20 years. Uh, so, uh, so there are a number of examples in this category. But the vast majority of countries that we surveyed do not explicitly refer to environmental justice, either legally or in the internal documents but it is addressed indirectly. For example, in the case of England, there's added protection for vulnerable groups through the anti-discrimination law and environmental uh, vulnerability is also part of that. In Croatia, right to a healthy environment is guaranteed in the constitution. And in New Zealand, there are safeguards for vulnerable groups in regulatory impact analysis. Now, in terms of how governments uh, identify which groups to look at in terms of disproportionate impacts. So, a bit to our surprise, we, uh, the most uh, the, the the characteristic most common in the survey was lack of access to key public services. So those who are already deprived of those public services, that's one of the areas where governments are choosing to focus to look at some of these other uh, some of these differential exposures uh, to en environmental imp impacts and policies. Uh, level of income is a close second. Then we have a cluster of variables: uh, age, health and disability, occupational sector, and gender. And a lot of it is mediated by the fact that the key policy concern for many governments is health, the health impacts of the environment. And many of these variables mediate those health impacts. Now, in the case of occupational sector, of course, environmental health is just one part of the equation. There are also issues about employment implications, particularly of uh, environmental policies. So that is also one more reason why occupational sector is important. 
Then we have uh, ethnicity or race and uh, indigenous populations. These are obviously context specific. So for certain countries, these are much more prominent than others, which shows that uh, a lower share. And then we have uh, migrant status, minority language and national origin, which are also considered by a small set of countries. Now, in terms of focus of measures to address environmental justice, uh, there's also significant variation. So a large majority of countries prioritize reducing barriers to participation. And here, in our view, we see the impact of the multilateral agreements also, particularly Eskazu Agreement and the Our House uh, Convention, because many of the respondents are parties to one of uh, these agreements. So that may have a role to play why countries are prioritizing this. Next comes improving access to the benefits of environmental policies. And roughly the same amount of countries uh, also prioritize reducing inequitable exposure to environmental hazards. What was a surprise to us was reducing inequitable burden of the economic costs of environmental policies. And about 40% of the respondents said that that was uh, a priority. This could be uh, a big weakness, particularly as we ramp up the ambition of environmental policies uh, in order to move to a net zero economy or a more circular economy and so on. So this, I think, is, is, is something that the governments would need to uh, focus more on. So just to summarize, how are different countries considering these three building blocks of environmental justice? I'm not expecting you to read the fine print. The basic point is the two messages here. First, all countries in different ways are addressing at least one, if not more than one pillar of environmental justice, whether they use the term or not. Second, there's quite a bit of variation in terms of how comprehensively they are addressing those concerns. And that's based on our assessment of the very detailed responses and documents that these countries shared with us. So now I just come to some final remarks. Uh, there are diverse approaches to addressing EJ and they are being used by countries regardless of terminology, because sometimes we come up with, uh, we face this comment that this is a very US term or a South African term. The underlying issues behind environmental justice are universal and, and they should be policy priorities uh, across the board. However, even countries with the most sophisticated frameworks still face persistent challenges to address the traditional EJ, what I'm calling EJ 1.0 concerns like toxic waste, for example, or air pollution. There was a very interesting study from the US which uh, showed that while air quality has improved over the past 35 years, the ranking of states in terms of air quality has not changed. So the inequities remain even if there's an overall improvement in air quality. South Africa, and I have the permission to quote them, is in their response to this questionnaire, they said, while all these institutional and legislative mechanisms may paint a rosy picture of environmental justice in South Africa, we face very significant challenges. And uh, there's a long quote, but I appreciate South Africa's agreement to use that quote. But at the same time, a new generation of EJ 2.0 challenges are requiring urgent global attention. It's not just about the disproportionate impacts of environmental bads. Now there's much more of a tension with the green agenda as we scale up policies. So just two kilometers from here in the Champs-Élysées, I think everybody talks about the Yellow West movement and pocketbook issues, but there are protests ongoing as we speak in uh, Argentina or, or places like Nevada against lithium mining, which is needed uh, to address the problem of critical raw materials and, and electrification of transport. There are protests by indigenous groups in many countries, but, but not just indigenous groups, but uh, many other communities against expansion of renewables and photovoltaics. Uh, so we have to grapple with these challenges and more international cooperation and sharing of good practice uh, is, is quite central. So that's my final word. There's value in mutual learning to propel this progress. This is why we did this report. This is why we organized this conference. Uh, thank you. Thanks, uh, Shadul, uh, and uh, congratulations to, to you and the team uh, for putting all the, the background research in and preparing this uh, report uh, in preparation for the, the conference. Thanks also to uh, the governments, the countries that responded uh, to the report and gave us the, the material to, to be able to work on. Um, I really hope it's whetted everybody's appetite uh, to read uh, the document from cover to cover. Um, now, 
I'm conscious we're already a little bit over time. Do we have uh, a chance for one question? Okay, one question, um, unless there are none. If not, okay, I'm going to uh, I'm going to say that brings us to the end um, of our discussion uh, and of this opening session. Um, I really would like to thank David uh, Page uh, and again uh, Shadul for uh, sharing your expertise and insights today. Um, I think it's it's really uh, opened the door uh, for a lot of interesting uh, discussion. Uh, I hope it's uh, contributed to a shared understanding uh, of uh, what environmental justice is, even if it is multifaceted um, and multidimensional. Uh, in doing so, ho ho hopefully given us a, a good foundation for uh, discussions this afternoon uh, and again tomorrow. I'm looking forward uh, to uh, discussion over the course of the, the conference. Really excited to see where the uh, collective effort can lead us in addressing persistent environmental injustices. Uh, and, and I think it really is a topic that is very much moving up the agenda, as Shadul said, um, while the world is going through a massive economic transformation in order to deal with environmental challenges, starting with climate change, but adding on uh, biodiversity loss, pollution, uh, water issues, uh, et cetera. Um, so I wish you all uh, a really productive conference. Uh, we are going to go straight into uh, the next session. Uh, so are the panelists for that session already in place? If not, can we invite them up? Yes.